Hi, I'm Mike Gilliam. Science in You starts now. I'm Grant Greenberg at the New York International Auto Show. Electric cars are no longer just an idea for the future, they're here now. And before you know it, batteries are going to be powering a lot more than you can even imagine. That's ahead on Science and You. I'm Mike Gilliam. For decades, solar power has meant the use of those huge, unsightly solar panels. But that's changing thanks to some innovators and artists. They're enhancing solar power. We'll show you what we mean coming up on Science and You. There's no time like the present to build and design the house of the future. We found a group of CUNY students who are hoping to catch the sun and bring it all home. I'm Ernabel DeMillo. I'll have all the illuminating details coming up on Science and You. Hi, I am Marlene Peralta. And no, I'm not at a park. I'm actually on the seventh floor of the Morgan Mail Processing Center owned by the post office at the largest green rooftop in New York City and only one of the many popping up around town. That's ahead on Science and You. I'm Donna Hanover. Many of us go toxic when we clean our bathrooms and kitchens, our clothes and our dishes. Why not go green instead? That's ahead on Science and You. I'm Carol Ann Riddell. Making wine and helping the environment at the same time will take you to a local vineyard trying to strike that balance. That's ahead on Science and You. Hi, I'm Lisa Beth Kovitz. Going green isn't just about where you throw your trash and how you clean your kitchen. I've got a report from Catch Key Farm in upstate New York that takes a look at some seriously nutritious, very green cooking. Ahead on Science and You. I'm Grant Greenberg for Science and You. With gas flirting with $5 a gallon, we're all looking at ways to save money and decrease our dependency on foreign oil. Well, electric cars are becoming a more viable and affordable option like the Prius over here and batteries are making a big difference in other areas too. The government says Americans use nearly 140 billion gallons of gas a year. That's billions with nearly 60% of that coming from foreign countries. So that pain you feel at the pump is a problem that doesn't appear to be going away anytime soon. One possible solution may be as simple as plugging in. That's what the MTA is doing. Batteries power a quarter of New York City's 6,200 buses. They, uh, they're good on emissions, good on fuel economy. Gary LaBeouf is in charge of New York City's hybrid bus program. The MTA purchased their first prototype in 1996 and began using them regularly on routes about five years ago. A diesel engine charges the batteries. They're under the white bubble on the roof. Then those batteries power the motor to turn the wheels. The buses aren't fully electric, but LaBeouf says this is an important step to putting the brakes on pollution. Now, we burn 55 million gallons of diesel fuel a year, so uh, we could be or had been in the past a fairly substantial polluter. We aren't now. These two banks of batteries are large enough to run a hybrid car. CUNY professor Sanjoy Banerjee is working to weed us off gas and oil. In the time it takes you to watch this story, Energy experts say the U.S. will consume more than a half million gallons of gas. That's a lot of emissions being released. Environmentalists say motor vehicles are the biggest contributor to ozone pollution. The American Lung Association even blames car emissions for contributing to health problems that kill tens of thousands of people a year. Banerjee says the solution is building better batteries that store more energy and last longer. Here's a quick look at how batteries work. Each battery is essentially a small power plant that converts chemical reactions into electrical energy. Right now, batteries can only handle a limited number of reactions before they stop producing electrical energy and need to be thrown away. You can think of this as like a little chemical plant now, okay? And that conditioning allows us to extend the lifetime of this battery by a factor of 10. So instead of getting three or four hundred cycles out of a battery, which is typical, we can get three or four thousand. That's the goal of the research going on in Banerjee's own little chemical plant. He and his students are working on ways to bring down the size and cost of batteries while increasing their strength and length of time they last. 
Companies like GM and Nissan are now releasing fully electric vehicles that don't require any gas to run and release zero emissions. You simply plug them in at home. Banerjee says the concern is they only get about 100 miles per charge, although charging stations are starting to show up in cities across America. The base price for these electric cars is about $25,000. It'll take, I, I would say, something like five years before you see a lot of plug-in hybrid cars. The sun doesn't necessarily shine when you need the power, and the wind does not necessarily blow when you need it. And we are not going to change our habits to suit the sun. We need lights when the sun goes down. Banerjee believes battery power is the way of the future and predicts it will be about a decade before we start seeing battery-powered homes. He hopes each reaction here will reduce the time it takes to see even more hybrids on the road, saying batteries are the best way to steer clear of pollution and foreign oil. I'm Grant Greenberg for Science and You. I'm Mike Gilliam for Science and You. As solar energy comes more and more to the forefront of our lives, innovators are pushing the envelope to bring us better products. Now, one of those is Sam Cochran. He is one of the inventors of something called Solar Ivy. Sam, what is Solar Ivy? Solar Ivy is a modular system for deploying solar panels across the surface of our buildings and takes the form of Ivy, the plant. Okay, so this is not your dad's solar panel. No, it's not. Uh, traditional solar panels are, are rectilinear and require a bit more to install them on the building and especially a bit more to install them on a facade. We have a very versatile system that allows for us to have a high level of customization so that each solar panel, while looking like ivy, is optimized for that location, uh, whether it's the building's location or that location of the leaf across the surface of a building. Show me. Um, so. Here we have one of the first working prototypes of Solar Ivy, and each one of these leaves is tuned for a specific angle and rotation given a building's location on the globe and that building's orientation. So, so let's say you're on the northern hemisphere and you have a, uh, a south-facing wall. Um, that would be an ideal location for solar. But not every building has that south-facing wall. So if you're southeast or southwest, we can tune Solar Ivy to maximize all of your solar gain for that that surface. Does it work better than the large panels? It works uh, in the same way that any large panel would, um, only we have fragmented cells. So while a large rectilinear panel has a, a higher density of cells, um, we're taking those cells and spreading them out slightly, um, allowing us for do that, to do that angle and rotation without shading other leaves. Cochran says the design is efficient. And depending on the technology, they can have many types of thin solar panels incorporated in the solar ivy, but be far more flexible than traditional solar panels. Now let's talk about the actual leaves themselves a little mm -hmm. bit. Now this is, this is actually one of the first versions of our new type of leaf. Um, it allows for us to orient the leaves in their angle and also rotate the leaves. And we're able to do that through a proprietary software so that we can look at a building, build uh, all of the surrounding elements that might be shading that building or affecting how much sun hits that building and have those elements of each leaf respond to that, that information. In this rendering, you see a brownstone covered with solar ivy. And Cochran says the cells on that facade could power the kitchen free for the whole year. But that does not include the initial investment of about $30,000 to go solar. Cochran says converting from early solar technology to solar ivy would be much cheaper. This actually happens to be a vacation home, so we would actually be pushing the power back into the grid since they weren't going to be using as much of it. Selling electricity back to the electric company? Yes. I like that. And they have to give you a check. <laughs> okay. That's great. The folks at Solar Ivy say eventually many of these applications could be adapted to be more mobile and used on things other than fixed buildings. Now, obviously all of the action in solar is not taking place in Brooklyn. There's a Toronto artist named Sarah Hall, and she's doing some amazing things with something called solar stained glass. What's solar stained glass? Uh, solar stained glass is where you bring together beauty, color, art, and solar collection. Have people embraced this? They have, and it's surprising. Uh, my current project is a cathedral, and it's the first uh, cathedral or even church in the world to bring together uh, its stained glass or its art expression and solar energy. 
The project is the Holy Family Cathedral in Saskatoon in Vancouver, Canada. Hall has designed and put together three large panels assembled in Germany. Everything about it is a perfect location for solar. They're 37 feet high, 12 feet wide, there's 54 panels. Um, they're all tempered triple pane, thermal panes. They're artwork and they're solar collection. How much solar energy would a project like that actually collect and how is that all going to work? Um, the, I think the easiest way to explain it is that it's about the same amount of energy as four or five households use in a year. Can you describe for me the process, how you put these together? The glass is tempered, which means that it becomes a safety glass. We then embed the solar cell into, uh, onto my art glass, and all of, the, all of the cells are wired together. We then bring clear glass on top and laminate it. The panels are wired together and the power passes through a conduit into the electrical grid and the church has paid for that power. The result? The cathedral spends next to nothing on its energy. Sarah Hall has other projects, including Harbor Front on Lake Ontario in Toronto and the Lux Nova Wind Tower in a park at Regent College in Vancouver that is powered by energy captured from the sun. She says she remembers the first night the LED bulbs came on. I almost cried that time. I really felt overwhelmed to see my work making light. Both Sarah and Sam Cochran see a lot more solar in both commercial and personal use over the next 10 to 15 years. I think that the solar industry has been very technically oriented and I think if they open themselves to imaginative use and um, more experimental things, this will, this will bring it ahead because there's lots of artists who would be interested to, um, to bring solar energy collection somehow into their work. So, we've shown some of the new solar technology, and one thing is certain, people are actively working to make solar a much larger part of our lives. For more on solar, here's my colleague, Ernabel Damilla. Harnessing the power of the sun is the goal of a group of City College architecture and engineering students in a prestigious competition to design and build a fully functional solar-powered house. CUNY's Team New York keeps their eyes on the skies. Students from universities across the globe gathered in Orlando recently to preview competitive designs entered into the Department of Energy's 2011 Solar Decathlon. Being New Yorkers, the City College team had little interest in building yet another solar house on the prairie, but rather one that would be right at home in an urban landscape. Their solution? the solar roof pod. The concept must meld together sound engineering and architecture with amenities that offer real-world practicality. Now and through the summer, the CUNY team will construct and test the house on the rooftop of a city college building. To do this right, team members have learned their way around wood and metal shops because everything designed for the 850 square foot house must be measured, cut and joined together by the students themselves. The pod uses lightweight, efficient materials with photovoltaic technology powering the lights and appliances. Solar thermal collectors will supply hot water and power the air conditioning system. Under professional and faculty guidance, Team New York will run the energy systems through a series of tests to adjust and maximize their efficiency. The design calls for smart windows that use PRISM technology to maximize daylight, potentially adding to the energy the house can generate for the larger building on which it sits. Designing an efficient, affordable, and attractive home is the goal of future engineers at City College who continue to strive for their place in the sun. In the fall, the CUNY students will take apart the house and load it onto trucks to make the trek to Washington, D.C., where they will reassemble the house on the National Mall, the final leg of the 2011 Solar Decathlon. I'm Ernabel DeMillo for Science and You. Hi, I am Marlene Peralta. Conventional gardening takes place in backyards or empty lots, but in cities like New York where there is not enough space for green areas, rooftops are becoming key in the efforts to go green. Rooftops like this one on Lexington Avenue and 97th Street are becoming a popular trend, especially in new constructions. Green roofs are, are beautiful gardens on the roof, and 
they have a perfect and very creative response to some environmental concerns that, so that we have. One of those concerns is the overflow of the sewer system. The soil with the plants actually uh, so retain the water for a certain amount of time and then release what is not needed slowly and later. In fact, Professor Raya explains that having a large number of green roofs can actually modify and improve the local weather. In an urban area, you have cements everywhere and it's very dry. If you walk in a forest, you feel there's some kind of moist around you. When you walk in a city, you don't have that, it's cement. So what, what we're doing now, having all this green roof, we actually have the capacity to, uh, to modify the moist content in, in the air. In another part of town, Michaela Crater and her organization, Sustainable South Bronx, are helping to build green roofs in low-income areas to improve existing health conditions. So we're standing right now on the Bronx County Courthouse building. The BOEDC and Borough President sponsored the Green Roof and it's about 10,000 square feet. We have power plants, we have sewage plants, we have lots of trucks. All these things really contribute and um, exacerbate health quality um, of the neighborhood. So we have high asthma, we have high diabetes, um, we have high levels of obesity and all of these contribute to a level of poor health. Um, Besides addressing health issues, Crater says green rooftops can lower your energy costs. Like this summer, we spend a lot of money on air conditioning. If your roof is cooler than it, uh, than it would be if it was black tar, you'll actually save money. But it's not like you get a big check. It's something that you experience over time. Dr. Raya explains the various green roofs we can find. One is intensive, the other one is, is extensive, and it's related to the depth of the of, uh, of the soil that you have. So uh, it really depends on the capacity of the roof to hold certain weight. And we talk about weight not only when you have just the soil and the plant, but when it rains. The most common ones are extensives, which require very low maintenance. Many of them have self-sustaining vegetation, such as sedum. You do have uh, engineered soil. Uh, there are you know, different kinds. And what is done, usually it's, uh, it's engineered in, in the sense that it's uh, artificial. They're uh, composed by uh, different minerals. Essentially in New York City, um, for a very low maintenance roof where you're not doing the bells and whistles, meaning you're not trying to grow a fruit tree, um, but maybe you do sedum or um, some other forms of vegetation, but not a really expansive green roof, it'll probably cost about $20 a square foot on average. Although the installation costs can be high, Crater says it is worth the long-term savings to one's pocket. Despite all the benefits and the spectacular views one can get from green rooftops, New York lags behind cities like Chicago and many others in Asia and Europe. That's why many hope the city catches on in becoming a greener Big Apple. For Science and You, I am Marlene Peralta. Welcome to Hot Sands. Today we're going to be looking at the viscosity of glass. Glass goes through an amazing number of transitions in its viscosity in a short amount of time. As a matter of fact, all of glass blowing really is kind of playing with that transition. I'm taking a punty, it's a solid rod. I've got the tip glowing red hot. I go into the furnace, put the tip below the surface of the glass, and I turn. You can kind of get an idea of what that viscosity is like. You see it running, it's getting a little bit longer off the tip because I'm holding it down. When I took the glass out of that furnace, it was about 2100 degrees. Now it's already starting to cool off a little bit. I can still bend it, but you can hear it. The surface of the glass is already starting to cool off. So the play with the viscosity in glass is also playing with the, with the temperature. The thing about the glass is it loses its viscosity as it cools off. It cools off at the thin places faster than at the thick places. So out here, I can't even move that at all. Down here where it's thick though, you can see I'm still moving it a little bit. Hi, I'm Donna Hanover for Science and You. Do you hate cleaning because of all those noxious fumes you breathe in from the products? Well, it's actually pretty easy to go green and save your little piece of the planet from toxic chemicals.
Several factors go into a green cleaning product. Is it plant rather than petroleum-based, so it's from a renewable resource? Is it biodegradable, so it won't hurt our waterways, like phosphates that deplete them of oxygen? And most of all, is it safe while you're using it and afterwards? At Green Depot on Bowery Street in Manhattan, store manager Anna Peglioni says that many conventional products, including bleach and ammonia, continue to off-gas over time, so if you go green, you avoid harm not just when you're scrubbing. You're also avoiding it, you know, every time you turn on your water or you're taking a shower, those chemicals are also, you know, you're inhaling them into your lungs. Green Depot is famous for its fun, soda fountain-style refill bar of green cleaning products that lets you feel virtuous about reusing your containers. And even when that's down for repair, there are giant jars of the green cleaners. Well, I brought my little bottles here, so I thought you could show me how to, and I didn't know which bottles would be best. I thought uh, there might be people who would say plastic. She brought plastic. Well, no, reusing plastic is really great because um, it's a way for you to get an additional life out of a single-use product, mm -hmm. like something mm -hmm. like a water bottle. So we definitely see a lot of plastic, and we encourage people to reuse it before they try to recycle it. Environmental journalist Brian Clark Howard says you can always go green the old-fashioned way. Vinegar is great for uh, mildew stains. The uh, it's, vinegar works very well on tile. Uh, it dissolves grease. Take some white vinegar. And if you don't have white vinegar, that's okay. You can also use apple cider vinegar. Uh, I wouldn't use a balsamic, though. No. <laughs> and I mix that in one gallon of water. And then you can put that into an old spray bottle. Any kind of glass surface it works very well. Don't use paper towels. To, uh, to wipe it clean, use old newspaper. A lot of people don't like the scent of vinegar, so you can substitute lemons for that. But if you don't want to make your own, Brian, who runs tests on lots of products and has written for the Daily Green, Earth 911, and The Atlantic, says many ready-made green cleaners have improved substantially in just the last couple of years. Uh, that's the biggest concern, is will it work? And the good news is that it does. It really does work. In 90% of cleaning cases, it works just as well, and it really doesn't require more elbow grease. So the other thing that's exciting is if you do need a little extra clean, there's now a lot of products that are replacement products for conventional cleaners. In any case, Brian says, try to avoid conventional products with VOCs, volatile organic compounds, that are added to improve cleaning performance but can hurt your breathing and may cause cancer or nerve damage. If you're convinced but feeling overwhelmed with too many choices when you decide to start green cleaning, Brian recommends going with a basic all-purpose cleaner since that can handle most jobs. He also gives high marks to companies that list all their ingredients. So start experimenting. A spritz here, a squirt there. It can all add up to helping to save the planet and your health when you clean green. I'm Donna Hanover for Science and You. I'm Carol Ann Riddell at Pindar Vineyards on Long Island. Is it possible to produce great wine and be earth friendly in the process? The winemakers here think so. Take a look. So this is finished. This These are known as the yeah, Himalayas at now. Pindar Vineyards. Three heaping piles of compost, steamy, smelly, and worth their weight in gold as far as Pindar Damianos is concerned. It's too bad it's not smell a vision. No, nah, it's you not. You can smell You it. can smell. You can smell yeah. the fermenting. Yeah. There's grape skins from this year's harvest. And, you know, when the sun hits on it, it's still fermenting and, and breaking down. Pindar Vineyard started this massive composting operation about four years ago, part of the trend towards sustainable agriculture. The goal to cut down on the use of pesticides and nourish the vines naturally. <laughs> So what exactly goes into these mounds? Area landscapers bring their leaf and lawn clippings. A local seafood wholesaler contributes fish waste. And everything that doesn't get used in wine production, like stems and grape skins, end up back here. What you can't see from the outside is the science experiment happening on the inside of these compost piles. It's probably 100 degrees inside there. That is really warm. Yeah, still breaking down. The piles are tended and turned for months. The end result, what Pindar calls liquid gold, compost full of nutrients to feed his vines. Like wine, the compost needs to age. Once ready, it's loaded into this truck and painstakingly spread across the vineyard, acre by acre. 
Pindar spends much of his time walking the vineyard and then walking some more. It takes him about eight days to travel the entire 400 acres. He examines the vines and literally counts insects. It's another part of the effort to move away from chemicals. By walking the vineyard, I can, I can look at the vine, I can look at the leaf, and if I see a disease and it requires it to save, save the grapes or save the vine, then I'll use the chemicals. If I don't have to, then I won't use it. Another key part of making wine is temperature control, and that's also an area where Pindar is trying to go green. The building that houses the fermentation room is equipped with a geothermal heating and cooling system that uses groundwater. Is it better for the environment than what would be a more traditional way of doing this? Yeah, it saves a lot of electricity and we're also recycling the water so we're not wasting water. On to the tasting room. The empty bottles here are recycled. Customers can bring back their corks for recycling as well. So what's next on the green agenda? Pindar is looking at wind power and at the other end of the environmental spectrum, kegs of wine that customers could have refilled, cutting down on waste. As Pindar explains it, making wine is about a give and take relationship. Growing grapes take something from the soil, so it's important to give something back. And that's a key ingredient for both a better glass of wine and a healthier environment. I'm Carol Ann Riddell for Science and You. I'm Lisa Beth Kovitz. Today we're on Catch Key Farm in upstate New York, a 60 acre organic farm where, in partnership with the Sylvia Center, we're going to get a chance to see just how green cooking can be. The Sylvia Center is a garden to table program that inspires children to discover good nutrition through direct experiences with seasonal fruits and vegetables on the farm and in the kitchen. Sylvia Center answers what I think is a fairly pressing need these days for children to understand where food comes from. Children are far too dependent and grown-ups are largely too on packaged and processed foods. In terms of nutrition, the closer you are to the source of your food, the better you are off. That's the green part. Why are free-range chickens so much better for us? Oh, well, first of all, the chickens get the diet that they really adore, which is a lot of bugs. Mm. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and um, they get to move around. And the flavor of the eggs, as you'll discover when we, when we eat lunch, is absolutely outstanding. So Nina, what is organic produce? Organic farming means no synthetic fertilizers, no uh, pesticides. Um, nothing has been used on any of this produce. And as you see, it's very happy and healthy. Um, the soil is enriched by compost mm -hmm. and um, it all thrives. Well, I've uh, got some of the eggs. I got a dozen of them in here. I took some of the cleanest ones. Um, <laughs> I'm just giving them a, a rinse. But if they were really crusty, like these, then you would take a scrub brush and you would really give them a, a good scrubbing. You can see we don't have running water here. And that actually forces us to be conservative, right? I'm not, as you see, running the faucet right. to clean one lousy egg, right? I'm just uh, using what, the little bit that I have here. See how yellow that is? You won't believe the flavor of these things. This stove runs on propane, which is a very inexpensive fuel, very easy to conserve. You can regulate how much you use. I've got some water in here with a steamer basket, and then I'm going to steam the potatoes and the beans. Steaming is great for vegetables because rather than boiling them, where you leach out a lot of the vitamins and nutritional value, they retain a lot of them, or most of them. So it's a really great way of cooking vegetables. From the Children's Garden at the Sylvia Center on Catch Key Farms, this has been Lisa Beth Kovitz for Science and You. That's our show for today. Thanks for joining us. I'm Mike Gilliam. See you next time on Science and You.